I am Sharon Verba, and I am Head of Research and Instruction here at Thomas Cooper Library. And with me is Karen Brown, who is our Instruction Coordinator and our research, a Research and Instruction Librarian as well. Um, for today's presentation, we will actually be asking you a few questions a few times, and then if you can hold your questions for us till the end, we should have a nice amount of time to talk about anything that you have questions about or want to suggest. Um, and what we're talking about today is, uh, it was a very hard title, Librarians at the Interdisciplinary Intersection, Bringing Together Information Literacy and Critical Thinking Skills for Student Success. And what we very much want to talk about today is how librarians work with students and faculty to bring things together. But for today, for right the second, we would like to ask you to put in the chat, how have you worked with librarians as part of your research or teaching? And I'm going to guess that none of you are possibly going to say we had to teach you how to use the Coward Catalog. Um, but anything else? <laughs> yeah, not yet. <laughs> Webinars only, okay. Well, let me talk a little bit about what we do as research and instruction librarians. Just for finding some resources, aha. There we go. Oh, turn it in, yes. I've worked on that some, systematic review. You have probably worked with Amy Edwards. Okay. Um, yes, <laughs> she's great. Um, excellent, those are excellent examples, awesome. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about the role of research and instruction librarians and learning with librarians on EndNote and other research tools. Exactly. Um, so, reference. This used to be our title. We still do this, but usually um, we do it over chat instead of over at a desk these days. And not just because of COVID, um, the students are very, very, very much online. And so are our resources. And we don't really do many reference questions anymore, such as how do I address somebody or something? What were the dates of blank, blank events? Who was the first person to do anything? And we used to do that a lot, but as my mother says, she asked the Google, and it told her. So we don't get a lot of those, but we still get lots of beginning research questions. How do I find articles? Where do I look for statistics? What's the best database for environmental sustainability? And these kinds of questions can be very much out of context. So we're seeing the students just out of quite literally the blue. And we spend much of our time doing the reference interview to figure out what the context really is. Is this for a class, a paper, or a presentation? Or is a patron looking to meet an assignment requirement, fill a gap in their research? Um, are they using the right words in the wrong database? Or is it the other way around? And we're working with patrons from all departments. So my background for um, my departments is I have a master's in both English and comparative literature, and I cover the departments for languages, literatures, and cultures, and I help with English, and I also do religion and philosophy. So those might be my subject specialties, but I am going to be working with students on every kind of question coming into those things. But again, it's not really much reference. It is a lot of research. And that's why our name has changed to Research and Instruction Librarians. So on the research side, we are all subject specialists either by training, education, or experience, and sometimes all three. Um, as subject specialists, we act as liaisons, which could mean helping with collection purchases, collection questions, communicating library information to departments and faculty. Um, but we also work with patrons of all levels on more involved research questions in our subject areas. These are usually done via scheduled consultations, which we call book a librarian here, because 
that's what we like to call it. And book a librarian is where we see patrons somewhat in context. We usually know what they're working on, could be a systematic review, could be um, an honors thesis, could just be a big paper, could be the beginning of a dissertation. We, you know, have time to talk about it. We have time to figure out all the ins and outs. As somebody else said, you know, work on EndNote. Do they need to have help with either EndNote or Zotero to build their bibliography as part of this bigger project? All the different things. And we're usually working with patrons in our own subject area. So again, sometimes when it gets to citations, we shift. Um, here we are often teaching patrons about advanced resources or advanced search techniques, which could be digital in the case of doing citation mapping, or could be analog, as in how to use a book index. You would not, you might be surprised at the number of students who are coming in who haven't had to use a print book with an index and dig out the information that way. This can also be where discipline-specific language can be a bit of a trip hazard for students who are just making that shift into the subject discipline. They're really, they're not beginning necessarily, but they're very much intermediate and they don't know all the ins and outs. Oh, and we also create and maintain research guides covering our areas. And these are things where we can hopefully get people started without having necessarily to rely on us because we're not there 24 seven. Close, but not quite. All right, and then the instruction part of our jobs. We all teach general research skill courses, such as English 102 and Speech 140. And in these classes, we could cover finding background information, selecting and using databases, creating and revising searches, assessing results for appropriateness, and more. It just very much depends on where the students are in those programs. Um, we also instruct upper level courses in our subject areas in advanced search skills and specialized resources. And in the subject classes, we are in context and with authority. And by authority, I mean those of you who are teaching. You are both the authority for us and for the students. And students trust faculty for advice on research absolutely the most. They will always trust their faculty member more than the librarian, and that's as it should be. Um, we are able, when we're in the classroom doing these kinds of instruction, we can verify on the spot what is meant by a requirement or terminology, which is really, really helpful and can really help dig it in for the students. So that is, frankly, also because it gets to use advanced search techniques and things like that, you know, which we're librarians, we love that kind of thing. Those are our favorite courses to teach. But we also work with faculty to ensure instruction addresses the needs of the students and the requirements of assignments. And we can even not do physical instruction, but just work with the faculty member on assignments. And finally, we create online tutorials. And these can be general or tied to a particular assignment or a particular resource. So that's basically our job. And through our jobs, we see it all. We see beginning researchers lacking search skills that so quickly and so easily become taken for granted that it's very hard to remember that you don't always know how to do some of these things. We see intermediate researchers tripped up by an unawareness of more specialized skills and resources or possibly language. We see advanced researchers thrown into confusion by altered resources, altered interfaces, and altered access, and we always apologize for these things when they happen. They almost always can't be helped. But today, we'd really like to talk about information literacy and bottlenecks that come up in information literacy that can be taught, caused by tacit knowledge. And I'm going to turn it over to Karen here. Thank you, Sharon. So we have another question, so take a minute think about it. Um, and if you have thoughts or um, about what does information literacy mean to you, Sharon, I would love it if you could drop it in the chat box. So we'll take a minute. 
Yeah, so how to gather, interpret information, reliability. Yes, with that validity. Definitely, that's something we talk about a lot with students. Yeah, and so what I'll be talking about is um, the framework for information literacy and student learning bottlenecks. So just a little bit of historical context. Um, the Association of College and Research Libraries, and that's a, I bet you can guess, a professional organization for um, library and information science professionals. Yes, and I'm seeing some other excellent um, responses in the chat box. Yes, very relevant. Um, and that gets actually to this definition that was um, developed in 1989 by Association of College and Research Libraries to be information literate, literate, a person must be able to recognize when information is needed, have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use effectively the needed information. Fast forward to 2000, and Association of College and Research Libraries information literacy competency standards were released. And I won't read through all of these, but these competency standards were very prescriptive. Uh, and each for each standard, there were performance indicators and outcomes. And these standards were used by library and information science professionals, so in this case, librarians working in um, academic institutions, to develop um, learning outcomes and tied to those learning outcomes and the assessment activities. Uh, but again, these were very uh, prescriptive. In each standard, for each one of these standards, there were very prescriptive performance indicators and student learning outcomes. It became apparent, I'd say about, it really started, discussion started bubbling up around 2010, 2012 within the profession that um, this was really no longer working. So fast forward to 2016, and the Framework for Information Literacy in Higher Education is the title of the document that was released, um, and it was adapted by Association of College and Research Libraries. And this framework consists of the six frames that you see here. Authority is constructed and contextual. Information creation is a process. Information has value. Research is inquiry. Scholarship is conversation. And searching is strategic exploration. And these are really a set of core concepts rather than standard learning outcomes, and they're very much designed to be nimble and flexible. And this document, Framework for Information Literacy in Higher Education, provides um, something to kind of hold up or frame um, the way in which research and instruction librarians like ourselves work with students and talk with students about information literacy concepts. These conceptual understandings were informed um, by a lot of different areas. So for example, Wiggins and McTeed's understanding by design, but they were also really informed um, as stated in the framework for information literacy by threshold concepts, which are those ideas in any discipline that are passageways or portals to enlarged understanding or ways of thinking and practicing in that discipline. These frames were developed, um, of course, by committees of research and instruction librarians, and they really focused on places where it felt like there were a lot of student bottlenecks or places where students were getting stuck. For each of the frameworks, um, for each of the, the frames, there is a uh, set of a, a general description, but there's also a set of knowledge practices, which are demonstrations of ways in which learners can increase their understanding of these information literacy concepts and dispositions, which describe ways in which to address the effective attitudinal or valuing dimension of learning. And you can see this is just an example from searching as strategic exploration. And again, these are not meant to be prescriptive, but rather interconnected, flexible core concepts that can be thought about and adapted for individual um, library instruction sessions. Again, the way that we might think about talking with students on chat or through book a librarian um, or uh, in those library instruction sessions. And our goal is not to turn students into librarians, <laughs> but I do believe these general framework concepts can really help serve students beyond their academic experiences. And as Sharon talked a little bit about, it's important that these concepts also be taught within that student's discipline. And here's why. 
So as research and instruction librarians, um, as Sharon talked about, we work with students across the U of SC campus in a variety of ways. We often find ourselves working across disciplines and experience levels. So we might have a lower level undergraduate student, a graduate student, we might have a traditional student, and we could have a student that's been out of school for a long time and they're just now returning. I recently came across an article titled Diving Deep, Reflective Questions for Identifying Tacit Disciplinary Information Literacy Knowledge Practices, Dispositions, and Values through the ACR Framework for Information Literacy. And that's quite a mouthful, I think. Um, citation for this particular article is at the bottom of this slide. But this article, it was um, something I was reading through, and it was a real aha moment for me when thinking about working with students across disciplines. The author of the article, Sarah Miller, this quote really resonated with me. In the context of information literacy, expert disciplinary approaches and practices surrounding the creation, use, and analysis of information that an advanced practitioner may take for granted are often tacit or unarticulated to learners. And we see this on a daily basis coming from students across disciplines. And our responses to their questions, uh, as Sharon mentioned, it, it's really often going to depend on from what discipline they're approaching a topic. Just to give an example, a couple of weeks ago, I had on our, um, our chat service a student, and the question was simply, I need to find a primary source on a flower. It seems like a very simple question. In my mind, though, I'm thinking, is a student in history? Are they taking a biology class, maybe an environmental science class? And so we work with students and talk with them a little bit more. Can you tell me a little bit more about what class is this is for? Um, if it's for a class, maybe it's just general interest if there are specific parameters of an assignment that you're having to meet. And what happened here, it became really apparent that the student was not clear on what made a primary source within the discipline of biology they had in their mind within the field of history. And so as we're working with these students, we're not only leading them to resources, but we find ourselves also educating them and talking with them about what makes for, in this case, a primary source within your specific field. As Sarah Miller points out in her article, Diving Deep, and we see this as well, we often have students apologize to us because they don't know something, where they'll say, I feel like I shouldn't have to be asking this question. Um, I'm sorry, I'm bothering you. And we see that quite a bit, and that's something, um, that's why we're here. Sarah Miller also really highlights decoding the disciplines, which is very visible within the framework. So the framework for information literacy, six frames with its knowledge, practices, and dispositions, focuses really on students stuck places or bottlenecks. In the framework's appendix, Bindorf and Pace's article titled Decoding the Disciplines, a model for helping students learn disciplinary ways of thinking um, is referenced. And it's very apparent that um, there are a lot of commonalities between this decoding the disciplines in the framework. And so the decoding the disciplines grew out of a faculty learning project at Indiana University, and it explores gaps about ways in which experts and novices think. Of the seven steps, the first two, defining or bottlenecks to learning and decoding expert thinking, really resonated with me, and they fit very well within the framework for information literacy. There are a lot of commonalities, and it's evident that those working on the framework, um, if you read the document in its entirety, had this decoding the disciplines in mind. The framework, again, it really focuses on student stuck places or bottlenecks. And as Sarah Miller highlights in her article, this relationship between decoding the disciplines um, and the framework, again, it's very apparent. And others within the profession have written about this as well. So again, these first two steps um, are what we as librarians, research and instruction librarians, find ourselves working with really on a daily basis. Um, so these bottlenecks is defined by decoding the disciplines and an evident in the, the framework and the discussion of threshold concepts or points where students are really getting stuck. Um, they're very much prevented from moving forward in an assignment um, or within the research process. And a lot of times they're stuck within a disciplinary context. What we often see when it comes to information literacy um, are students who are lacking that kind of knowledge from experts in their field. If that knowledge is implied or it's tacit, um, they, they're not sure how an expert would do these things or how they might define these things. And it might be that it hadn't been explained to them. Maybe it was, but they missed it. So there are a lot of different reasons why that might happen. 
But these are some examples um, that really came to my mind that I've worked with um, over this past academic year. And it's something that we see frequently. We'll have students, and again, this could either be through Book a Librarian, it could be chatting with students before a library instruction session. Um, and in this case, these were some students that, uh, some questions that I was, uh, we receive on our Ask Library in our chat service. And again, the student might type in, I can't find sources on my topic. And so we conduct, talk with the student, conduct a little bit more. And in this case, oftentimes, it's not unusual for us to find out that they're having a very difficult time identifying keywords. This really goes back to that frame, searching is strategic exploration. Um, they're not familiar with the terminology in that discipline. They might need, um, as Sharon mentioned, for maybe some classes of speech or English 102, they might need some background information to, to just get a better understanding and to learn, again, a little bit more about the terminology. I need to find an empirical article. What is that and how do I find one? Um, this really gets into kind of that idea of scholarship as a conversation. And in this case, this question is twofold. Um, we're talking with a student about what empirical article is. And then the second step, to, again, depending on their discipline, so we talk with them a little bit, or they're in the field of psychology, we might go to psych info, um, sociological abstracts, again, it really just depends. And work with a student to familiarize them with that discipline specific database within their field. I mentioned the find primary source on a flower, and that ended up it was a student for a biology lab. Um, one we had recently was I found an open access journal article, but my source has to be found through the library. How can I find this article using library resources? This gets into, and again, kind of going back to the frames, it just gives us a way of thinking about things. Information has value, so open access, there's not a paywall. Um, and again, just kind of that idea how to scholars, um, what is the conversation like in that particular discipline? And I really appreciated what the faculty member here was doing because they were really trying to have students use library resources and we love that. They were trying to have students locate credible sources. In this case, this was an open access journal. We do have to be careful with those because some of them are predatory, but it was determined that it was a pretty reputable open access journal, um, but we just did not have it indexed or available through any of our library resources. So we eventually um, referred that student back to their professor just to we gave them the information that we had about that journal and you know just to double check because we're not the ones that are great um, that that final paper i need scholarly articles on COVID 19's impact on tourism and this was one that i got this past summer and so this kind of got into a conversation about how it can take a little while for um, that kind of research to be done and then produced and gone through a peer-reviewed process and finally published in a scholarly article and so with this particular student um, that was a conversation we had on chat a little bit. Uh, there were some things available, but figuring out ways they did have to have scholarly sources that we can maybe broaden this out a little bit and you can relate it back to COVID-19. Is this source credible? That's something that will get asked a lot as well. And this really gets back to authority as constructed and contextual. Um, in different situations, different kinds of sources, will be credible in one situation a tweet is what you might need as opposed to a scholarly article. And so here again, talking with the student a little bit more about what they're trying to find, um, what are the parameters of the assignment and talking with the student about ways they might be able to evaluate that source or if we might need to move on and find something else. My last example is I need to find a newspaper source. And here again, this sounds like a theory this simple question. Um, what we're finding, uh, as Sharon mentioned, um, I've been working as a research and instruction librarian since 2004. Um, I, I am in my 40s, and so I have a clear um, memory of physical newspapers. And so there's sometimes that generational divide, and there's no absolute way to determine, but within a library setting, um, we'll find newspaper sources in different places. And again, here also needing to know, are you a history student? Maybe needing to find that as a primary source. Are you looking for newspaper sources that um, reference research, current research studies? So here again, um, it's, it's not a simple question. It does take some time for us to work with the student to figure out really what it is and what they're trying to find. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Sharon now. Thank you very much, Karen.
Okay. This last question I do really would like you guys to think about and, and possibly answer, but at least think about for yourself. What kind of tacit knowledge do you see as a bottleneck for your students, or did you find for yourself when you were entering the field that just, you know, now you don't even think about, but at that time was just something you just did not understand? And what we really need is music to play. Uh, what are the best ways that students can get a help online? I'll get to that, Azar. <laughs> Reliable source, yes. Where to get sources, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh yeah, interlibrary loans. They, I came from a very small school. When I got to a big school and those existed, I was absolutely blown away. Anything else? Understanding search terms. <laughs> peer reviewed. And oh my peer reviewed. How to use an online library. It is tricky. It is, it, it's such a mix of online and, wait, now you go into the stacks. It's so tricky. And I will say, I was one of those people who, I went from a very small college into a very large graduate program, and my first hitting all the critical um, literary criticism terms, the really intense ones, I was just at sea until a nice librarian gave me a dictionary. <laughs> I learned how to use a specific, very particular, critical terms dictionary. Yeah. No, it is. A lot of students do not know where to start other than Google. And yes, it's a, it's a conundrum sometimes. All righty. I am thanking you all. Okay. So this next part. Karen's going to talk a little bit about um, some ideas about ways you can approach it. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about some concrete assignments that might help. And then at the end, we'll get back to talking about, as in, um, let's see, Azar asked what are the best ways for students to get help online, and then we'll, you know, other things that you guys are wondering about. We'll get to all that. So Karen, go ahead. Let me switch over to the next slide. Thank you, Sharon. To talk a minute, just again, and this is just from the perspective um, that, that we see on our end working with students. And one thing we always try to stress, stress to students when we are working with them, that there's, you know, no question is a dumb question. We are here to help. That's why we are here. Um, and we always appreciate, we love it when they contact us and they reach out to us. Um, but students may or may not have learned general information literacy concepts in high school or general or general education courses. It really just depends. And just two quick examples. In fall 2016, I served on a South Carolina Association of School Librarians conference panel. So this is K through 12, um, organized by Karen Gavigan. She's a faculty member at the um, University of South Carolina School of Information Science. And there were a couple of academic librarians. We had some K through 12 librarians. Uh, and some faculty members from the information science program. And the title was your high school seniors or our college freshmen. And what I learned during this panel, and I, I kind of knew about it, but I didn't know to what degree, is that many school librarians are at least media specialists. And this is happening frequently um, in, in K through 12 public schools here in South Carolina. Um, their primary responsibility in some cases has shifted to more of um, maintaining the school's one-to-one -one program. So if a laptop is assigned to a student, um, a, a lot of times they're also responsible for, in addition to the school media center, the school library, maintaining those laptops for all of the students in that school. Um, again, this was in 2016, so it's been a number of, you know, a number of years ago, but um, from what I understand and talking to others in the field, this is, this is really taking away the amount of time that media specialists can work with classroom teachers. We may or may not see students for first year English courses or other general education courses. We also have students that transfer in, so they might have come from another institution. As Sharon just talked about, she started a graduate program coming from a very small university. Um, and so students may or may not have had any kind of an introduction to library resources and services. Uh, again, as we talked about, disciplines vary greatly in their approaches to information literacy concepts. So as students move into their majors, uh, there is sometimes some 
difficulty in, in transferring what they may have learned in a lower level general education class into that specific discipline. Talking with your students about, in, in your field, how information is created and distributed, um, what makes someone an expert, how are um, scholarly conversations, how is it communicated in your particular field, I think can be very beneficial. Being clear in terminology, just making sure that students understand. Sometimes we'll have students, um, there are still faculty that will tell students to find a monograph. The student has no idea what that means. Um, designing assignments that incorporate critical thinking skills, so not only asking students to maybe find an article from a specific journal, um, but to use that information in a meaningful way. And then when you're designing assignments, just taking into account different information formats and trying to maybe provide a little bit of criteria for assessment. My last slide before I'll turn it back over to Sharon, uh, making sure students have the necessary research skills. Um, and this could just be talking with students. Have you uh, had an introduction to university libraries here at University of South Carolina? Have you um, used any discipline specific um, databases? Have you used anything beyond Google? So again, just maybe questioning a little bit to kind of see where they are, um, what kind of experiences they've had if they've had any at all. If you do have an assignment um, or a project where you're asking students um, to use library specific resources or even if it's something through Google Scholar, those kinds of things, um, just testing it yourself. We're also available to test it for you. So as Sharon mentioned, sometimes interfaces change, um, things get updated so it can throw a level of uh, confusion in if things are different. Um, and this kind of gets into the next one, suggesting um, we can also make sure that suggested resources are accurate and up to date. Um, we've had the semester students asking where LexisNexis is, and that's a, a database available. It was through University of Libraries. They had a name change. It changed to Nexus Uni, and their interface changed. And so we were receiving a number of questions from some very poor students that were very confused about what they should be doing. It was because, again, um, some of the, the name of the database changed and, and the way in which it, the interface and the way in which it search changed. And as Sharon touched on this before, uh, recognizing that your students will take cues from you. Um, so the attitude that you take towards research projects, um, if you're accessing resources or services, things, even things like interlibrary loan um, through the library, uh, talk with students, uh, you know, with excitement about your own research, um, including barriers that you might have found um, that you encountered. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so I have just a few practical things, and there's there are lots more. I don't want you to think that these are by any means all, um, but these are just a few ways that you can help students decode your discipline. Um, one would be a developing search strategies assignment and you have students document their process breaking down a broad topic into smaller manageable research questions and this could be a concept map this could be just a list this could be just sketching it out there are lots of ways to do it you know don't have to be prescriptive about it but having them actually go through the act of working out what they're trying to do and then ask the students to develop a list of keywords and synonyms related to their research question. Um, it is amazing how many students just get frustrated and stuck car and automobile. I mean, it's simple things that, again, once you understand these kinds of little, you know, you almost don't want to call them tricks. They're not really, but ways of looking at research you completely do them automatically, but for a beginning researcher, they might not be. Um, yes, okay, so the one developing search strategies, um, selecting and exploring article databases. This is a really good assignment that people can give if they want their students to learn, and especially I would say maybe for that intermediate, second level kind of course, where students select 
one or two subject specific databases related to their topic and really get into just how does this work? How does this work as a tool for my research? And this might take a little bit of talk from a faculty member, or again, this is one where maybe you have the librarian come in and work through it with them. And I can say PsycInfo is one where there are so many ways to do things in that database that really, really can make a huge difference in how students use it. But of course, it comes to us from EBSCO, and it looks almost exactly like Academic Search Complete. So if a student is coming from using that, Academic Search Complete, into using PsycInfo, they're not going to scroll down and see all the really cool things. They're just going to be kind of muddling along, same general kind of basic search skills that they were doing in Academic Search Complete. So, but having an assignment that specifically either is prescriptively or just says, no, go through, go look at the advanced search. Tell me what you can do there. Tell me how you can scroll down and, and what things are available to you. Or again, kind of tricking them into doing it by working them through it. Um, either way, that can be one that can really open their eyes up to what's available. Another one, and this, is really important and I would say maybe at that junior level where they're getting into the idea of the scholarly conversation, contrast, compare, and evaluate. And providing students with two different sources and each source, source should be a different format. So a journal article and a blog post, a conference proceeding and um, a trade publication. Any different little mix like that, that is giving them two different ways, but are talking about the same topic, that they can see and actually analyze what are they getting from each of them. Are they getting very quick, up-to-date information from one and a very thorough analysis from another? What are they seeing? Are they getting preliminary information? And again, this is different for each field. For some fields, it might be that the best information comes from conference proceedings. For other ones, it might be that you don't touch anything that's not a peer-reviewed article in your own particular research. You might use the blog for some, you know, quick help, but nothing else. So again, it's very, it's very discipline specific, and that's where the faculty are the ones who are going to be able to help the students most understand where am I going with this. Um, asking students to closely read and evaluate each source on authorship and authority, intent and objectivity, content and currency. And again, this comes to, it used to be, it was very prescriptive when we, we were sure we could accurately say, is this a authoritative, reputable source? And the answer is again, and it's such a hard one for students to understand, but it's true that in different contexts, it might be, it might not be. Um, what, is it, what is the actual source and what is it doing? And where does it fit in within your research? So that is a tricky one. Um, we do work with students a lot about that and, and we can help them. But at some point, it does become a thing where it kind of works, depends very much on the discipline and where they are in the process. Oh, and the compare, contrast, evaluate can be really good for just a solid introduction to primary, secondary sources. And we do actually have um, the biology program does have students find very specifically a primary source and then very specifically a secondary source and compare those on and I believe very often it's a mosquito because I have learned the Latin word for mosquito from this assignment. And it's not something I really want to know. I just, every year when it starts coming up, I'm like, oh yeah, it starts with a drop cystis thing. All right. And okay, last promo slide. University libraries can help. You can get in touch with your subject librarian, and a list of subject librarians can be found from the library's homepage. And you just go to library services, faculty instructor services. You can go to get research help from the library's homepage, and you can also just go to, again, library services to sign up for an instruction session. 
faculty and instructor services. I'm seeing some questions here in the chat that are very good ones to answer. And I'm going to back up a little bit because Azar had asked, well, a systematic review that is interesting. Azar, you're on your own. No, <laughs> it's tricky. Um, but thinking about questions, sample assignments. Um, Azar says, my students have final project presentations and assignments would be great. Oh, progress report forms are very, very good. I, the sample assignments of having them actually, even if you didn't do compare and contrast of different things, had them pulling their resources and you asking them, all right, why is this, um, how are you using this in your resource? And if you're, they're doing it early and you're seeing in the progress report, you can catch a lot of errors um, by just having them write out, not, I don't want to say um, an annotation, but literally tell you, what am I getting from this journal? How am I using it? That can really make a big difference. And actually, I used to do that in my Library 101 classes, would have them tell me that instead of, later on they would write the annotations, but I really just wanted to know how they were using it. And that was where I found a lot of problems. I fix a lot of problems. And Shauna says she has considered making our USC library online search an, an assignment. Uh, but 100 for asking help one hour before the assignment as soon as overwhelm the librarians. Shauna, there is a way to prevent this. You can have them, part of the assignment, <laughs> be um, where previous to the speech is due, the speech is due on X day, the day that they have to give you some of their citations is a little bit earlier. And then, yes, they'll still be coming into us, but there's a little bit leeway there on when we will get them all. And we can also do just a class session for y'all. That is, you know, not a problem. And we do sessions for people online or in person. Um, we often, I, I feel bad. I mean, this semester has been very, 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 very odd. Our classrooms are on the lower floors and are too small for us really to bring in classes um, when you need to have spacing. But when the time comes back, I mean, we were happily have everybody back in class again. I can't wait. Um, and Azar, one of the other things you might want to do is contact your subject librarian. In your case, it's Marilee Birchfield, and ask if she has some suggestions of assignments, because she has seen a lot and done some, and you know, seen a lot of both assignments come through, but I've done a lot of looking in that field. So she probably would have some good suggestions. And Azar, I think you had asked where is the best place for your students to get help. Down here at the very bottom of the page, there's this little Ask a Librarian. But you can also find this under Get Research Help, where you have this live chat online, Ask a Librarian. But most importantly, if you let your students know that in almost all of the databases, once you are in them, there's an Ask a Librarian tab that is us, where it's their librarians. It's not just some big person out there doing things. So, I mean, that same chat, they can get to us from almost all the databases, as well as the, the home pages in the Get Research Help page. Also, I wanted to point out, if you're from another U of SC campus, um, mm -hmm. I think I saw someone maybe from Aiken, that all of our campus libraries, so University of South Carolina Aiken, um, their research and instruction department, or their, or they might have a different name, reference department, we all do very similar things. And so they would also be able to help as well. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much.